Um, one of the things that Debbie and I have been talking about in the background um, on our day-to-day -day basis is perhaps thinking about a podcast where um, we sit down with somebody and, and basically have a conversation with them um, from time to time. And so what we have here today is perhaps a first experiment where we have uh, have a guest and we're going to sort of start a conversation and we invite you to ask questions on both platforms in the chat and uh, in the Q&A as they arise, as they come up. Um, and so our special guest here, um, we're excited to have uh, Scott Lowry, I think I'm saying it right, maybe, I'm not sure, um, from iNaturalist. Um, and Scott has recently uh, got in touch with us because he discovered that the species files were migrating from taxon work, uh, from an old system to taxon works and had some questions initially about how he could continue to access the nomenclatural data from those small orders, for example, that Heidi talked about this morning. And so Scott, welcome and thanks for your time um, here. And I thought maybe we would start off our conversation by um, um, saying congratulations. Uh, if you have heard the news and followed iNaturalist recently, you've heard that they've just uh, received a new status, I think as a nonprofit, is, is that correct? And then, and then you've also received grant funding. So I thought maybe you could um, say a little bit about your role in iNaturalist and talk about, to start off with, how you, um, the, the process behind that process where you became a nonprofit and uh, received that grant. So Scott, welcome here. Everybody, um, thanks for having me, Matt. It's great to. Um, I don't know. There's definitely, a, obviously, a lot of overlap between the INAC community and this community, and I think it's cool to think about. Um, yeah, just think about uh, uh, points of synergy. Um, just to your question, Matt. Like, so INAC has been around for a while. I think you way to start it as a master's project in 2008, and I got involved in 2010. So, the project's really like 15 years old, but we just launched as an independent organization from the California Academy of Sciences and uh, National Geographic as a nonprofit this this um, summer. So that's been really exciting and, and fun. Um, you know, I think our constant challenge with iNaturalist is just trying to sort of rebuild this thing at different scales and so that it keeps working as the community gets bigger and as the data set gets bigger. And I feel like I've kind of had the informal role of taxonomy czar, you know, which isn't a super scalable role and it hasn't been a super scalable process. And, you know, we've been trying to increasingly lean on external taxonomic providers, even though it's hard with the community because it's, you know, I think the, the philosophy of iNaturalist is that people are making identifications conditioned on a taxonomy, but there's also a lot of people who have the skills to make those identifications have very strong opinions about taxonomy. So there's a, there's an overlap there, but we're trying to at least get it to be a structured overlap and i think there's really great examples on iNaturalist where like i mean just spitballing here but like you know so we'll say we're, we're generally following the reptile database which is peter Uitz, i don't even know if he's on this call but be great you know great reference does tons of work um maintaining that and then you know if the community says well i think something different you know then this question is like let's first check what the reptile database and make sure like what their stance is on this and then if there really is this point where there really is this difference of opinion, then we a naturalist can accommodate what we call a deviation. And I think that's working quite well. It doesn't work when these references aren't um, kind of keeping pace with what the community wants or when they're not sort of responsive, which I know is a huge ask. And then it obviously doesn't work when there's just big gaps in the taxonomy. So I'd say like fungi and butterflies are some of these places where we just have no reference at all. Plants, you know, we've been using Plants of the World Online, which in theory is this great reference, but our community is super interested in these internodes. So things like subsections and sections and subgenera, and that's not in there. So even though we now have a framing of family genus species, which I think is extremely useful for constraining this project and just putting some anchors in, you know, there's still just like we have with fungi with genus and species, you know, we have these huge debates about whether there's four subfamilies and six subsections. So that's a problem too. But you know, no, no question, these references help, and so that's why I conversation with, with Matt started is just we're really grateful. I mean, iNatural is the biggest group we have as insects in terms of number of observations and obviously number of species, and then you know, it's followed by plants, and so it's um, been extremely helpful to get any kind of anchors in the sea for for um, invertebrate for for terrestrial invertebrates, insects, 
And I guess for us, the big win would be butterflies. That's the group where we have the most observations and we're completely unmoored from any sort of shared sense of what taxonomy we're all supposed to be talking about. Yeah. So as a history from our side, we imported LEP index. LEP index was a famous card catalog that evolved before computers were around and that slowly merged into several digital versions. And Scott, you know, you've, you're in conversation with Donald Hoburn, who's yeah. trying to revitalize some of that community with LEP index. And um, it, it, he has updated a couple of the families, but obviously it's an immensely popular group. And like you said, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, but yeah, I would be curious to see what we would have to do to adapt that resource and and Donald's work with the LEPs to um, to make it more useful, right? Like, do we have to break out small groups and flag them as ready? Do we, uh, you know, do we have to make better synchronizing tools so that I know Donald has been asking for tools that can merge outside data inside so that editing that happens in different worlds, maybe it's even editing that happens in INAT would be able to be merged into that sort of master list. So there's a lot of challenges there. And that's a, that's a particularly um, tricky one because of all the activity on the taxonomy and the debate, I think, that goes on it. So, um, But yeah, it is fun to think that, that that data sat in our system for a long time. It was basically passed off because they didn't have the support from the Natural History Museum to, to maintain it. and. There was questions about whether or not it would become useful and, and, and Donald has been very active in that in that database so um, it would be cool to see it getting more use and, and getting more uh, more um, momentum behind it um, so so maybe you can give us a bit of a high level perspective on how iNaturalist manages its nomenclature you talked about uh, cool ideas like deviations and um, you're using something I think you called taxon frameworks to 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 manage it so from a like very slightly technical perspective can you say how you go out and harvest names and and sort of link it into your observations yeah sure um <laughs> maybe i can share my screen it's funny I sure yeah sure sure away. pull up uh, yes. plants of the world online and then someone mentioned to me earlier on a totally different slack message that plants of the world online is down today so maybe this is not the best example to use but I already opened up two other screens. So um, uh, let me do that. One second. Um, apologies. Share my screen. Uh, okay. You guys see this? Got it. Okay, yeah. great. So, um, and I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with INAP, but I'm gonna go first here. Um, so, um, every species on iNaturalist has a, every node on the tree has a taxon page. So this is like the, and this isn't, I was just trying to navigate here and let me try to get to a better one. So for example, for the genus, um, Calicordis, which is, you know, a genus in the lily family. So this is the, this is the taxon page. And, um, you know, this is the entity when someone makes an identification, it's on an observation, but it's connected to a taxon on the, in the taxonomy, you know, we have nodes at every nodes. And so like, um, and so we see this node genus Calicordis has about 86,000 downstream observations so, that are tied to it through identifications, but that's actually through these identifications. And then, you know, we can scroll down here and see the um, the taxonomy. So like I said, you know, so here's someone's, we have this subfamily in here, but we have the genus and a bunch of species under there. And if I do taxonomy details here, you know, you see that this is actually one-to-one -one matching to what Plants of the World Online means by, by um, Calcohortus. So when we have one of these taxon frameworks in place, the first thing is, it's just to try to link those up. This is called alternate position because the the parents are actually different. You know, so on Plants of the World Online, it's genus Calcohortus, family Liliaceae, because they don't have these internodes, and that's why these internodes really create a lot of complexity for us. But the and that community really wants them, man. I mean, it's amazing the number of internodes and the amount of pushback if we say like we really don't want to support tribes, you know, and whatever this is. So it's it, but in a perfect world you know, the reference would match that whatever we're talking about. 
But so, I mean, so the, on the most basic level, one thing that we can measure is we call these relationship unknowns. So this is like for the family, Lily ACE. These are all the taxa in iNaturalist that are that do not match anything in, in the reference. So in this case, plants the roll line. So in theory, we should have none of these. So these are so you think about it. There's like species in plants the world online that are not nine at there's species in INAT that are not in plants of the world online and then there's ones that match like the ones we're just looking at the genus and so these are all the ones that are nine at not plants of the world online and so in theory all these should be taken care of like the, the curator should be curating these to get in line with pow and that and plants of the world online and that's what i mean by having a Sort of a north star these references are really important as a north star for the community because then the then the marching orders for curators is just like do what you need to do in order to match a reference whereas if you're talking about butterflies or fungi that's mixed in with like what do we even want you know or do we do we think of calcohortus as this big genus mm -hmm. sensu latu that or sensu strictu and then those arguments really spiral and we're we're sort of stuck there with these groups like fungus and lepidoptera but when we have a reference like this it works really really well um, and so then, you know, essentially the things people can open flags, which is to sort of proactively be like, there's some issue here. Um, we can do a tax on change. So in this case, like, I, I, and I apologize, I tried to open Powwow and I guess it's down today. It's not responding. Um, but we, you know, I could go over there and I could see what they, they probably call this a synonym of something else. And then what I could do is if it's that something else is already in INAT. I could just do a taxon change of swapping this into that, and that would move all the contact over and cr call this a, a junior synonym to that. Or um, I had would have to create that new thing, destination, and swap everything over. I could do more complicated things like splits, you know, if like something's actually splitting, do a merge. And then if we do want to deviate, I could add a relationship that's other than a match. So I could say, for example, you know, we're actually keeping this thing, thing, you know, so we'd have on this side, on the power side, maybe you have Calcohortus, whatever, Sensu Latu. And on the INAT side, we're going to have that Sensu Stricto and Calcohortus Multicolor. So it's enable, it's enable for us to say, like, we're intentionally deviating from the reference. So that's one thing that, like, curators are doing is constantly just kind of going through here and, um, you know, trying to mop up these relationship unknowns. And every week when we sync with these external references, I think of these taxon relationships as little bridges that are constantly breaking because things are changing on the reference side and then they sort of have to rebuild them and, and mop this stuff up. But I'm not as good at that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of workers or people helping. It's just, they need clear direction. And the other thing that people can help is we can look at flags. So these are just open flags. So I just searched for all the open taxon flags with lilies. And just to give you guys a flavor of the same group, like what they are. So this is someone saying like, I would love this hybrid, which is another annoying thing, kind of like internodes where it's like, ah, oh, those aren't in powwow. You know, but people really want them. I think we need more clarity about whether we're supporting things like hybrids because with birds, it's really out of hand. <laughs> you know, this person saying, hey, this is a full species in powwow, you know, so that's just essentially proactively a nudge being like, please deal with this thing. Um, again, I want this to be a separate species. So this would be, since we have a reference here. So if this was butterflies, that would be a big question. Well, do we want to do that? What's our reference? How do we decide? But here it's quite straightforward because we can now look at powwow and say like, well, what you're proposing is either in line with powwow. So thanks for the nudge. Curators will move in that direction or that's different than powwow. And that gets into the things I was talking about using the Peter Utz example, which is like, hey, you know, can we please have a conversation with powwow and see why they don't treat tulip the same way? And ideally, either they change something on their side or we go with what they want. Or if we can't agree, then we structure a deviation um there's also usually i don't see any here but there's usually a lot of stuff with things like common names come up a lot which is annoying because those usually aren't sort of in the purview of of um taxonomic providers you know they usually don't have common names usually there's a lot with these internodes which is like subsection or something that's not in the thing and a lot of times there's stuff with what we call conservation statuses which is like the species should be obscured from the public, it's endangered, and we sort of handle that through the same infrastructure. But I would say those are the two main tasks of curators is mopping up those relationship unknowns, keeping an eye on these flags, trying to get rid of them. And then some of these operations are quite complicated. Like if you actually say, okay, we have this one lizard and it's being split into these three lizards, you know, the job of the curator is constructing these quite complicated things in our naturalist we call taxonomic strip splits that, you know, make sure that all these IDs get replaced by that one there and that one there and that one there. 
And I think that's another general miscommunication about iNaturalist that isn't great is that we call the people with the powers to do this work curators. Really what they're doing is complicated, tedious, annoying work that involves just deep in the bowels of iNaturalist bad functionality. But I think some of the community perceives it as sort of like an expertise thing. Like, well, I'm, I'm really an expert in Calcohortas. I should be a curator. And I think that's a messaging problem on our side is that it's not really about expertise. It's about the ability to kind of like shepherd data from point A to point B. Yeah. Except it sort of bleeds more into expertise for groups like fungi where we have no no reference, you know. So someone actually saying we should treat Amanita sensulato is actually kind of useful because we don't have anything. But when we do have a reference, we can constrain the curator role more to the sort of like just get it done to curate it in that direction rather than any sort of high level decision making. Yeah. I really like that concept of uh, um, like in taxon works, we try to keep nomenclature separate from the concepts. And I, you can, from hearing you talk about this, you can, it's clear you're doing that similar sort of thing. And if you do that, then you can direct people, like you said, to, to make fairly objective statements. So, so, and so said this in the literature, right? Like we can all agree that somebody said that this is a synonym of that, whether or not the two biological entities are the same, that can be an expert conversation at a different level, but we can do a lot of mining and we can do a lot of sort of work behind the scenes, like you alluded to, um, simply by uh, sort of directing people, like capture the data in this way. And I think the way that we've set up the nomenclature in taxon works, um, it, it's it's fairly amenable to capturing those basic facts from the nomenclature side of point, and then letting them being applied out to these various different groups. Um, I'd say we have the same problem with with ranks and internodes in taxon works. We only want to manage a couple because it becomes a headache and we the the nodes we really care about are the ones that um, are governed by the rules of nomenclature the different codes the four or five different codes so we have different classes for all of those ranks and we do that because we have to throw logic onto all those but if it's above like family group in animals or there's some plant group plant rules that are applicable for higher groups then um, if it's above those then they're not governed we don't really care and we don't you know we don't have that classification flexibility that i think people want in some ways as well we have and we, what we think is enough but yeah it's interesting that it comes up as a problem for you as well or not a problem but a challenge um you said what is um so uh, i had a question about the the powwow so here you have uh people doing some hard work looking going going and looking up at those names and uh they have a reference that you're you're confident and and you you want that to be the north star so to speak um so when you discover something in and you make this decision um, that that we need to talk to powwow how does that annotation and that feedback loop come back and forth right how do you communicate with powwow how do you um, see that they've made changes is, is that strictly algorithmic um, can you talk about that feedback loop that seems to be a holy grail in a lot of cases yeah. um, but but yet rarely achieved in a real uh, satisfactory way yeah, I just want to say, first of all, whoever these people are maintaining these taxonomies are doing just a huge service. And most of the people I've talked to, it's not their job. It's like a thing they do on the side. And it seems to be just the most thankless task. So I just hope whoever is taking on these these roles is is grateful, you know. It, but there is also as a trade-off, like I'd say worms is a good example. We rely on worms as the world uh, registered marine species. That's one where they do seem to have a, a good, resilient institution that's built up. But we don't have a clear sense of really who's accountable, you know, and that's the one that it does seem like when people sort of say, well, well, email worms, no one really picks up the phone on the other side. And so I think that's the, you know, that's an example of a bad trade-off where they're just not super responsive, but the good trade-off is like, I worry some of these things were like, not to put Peter, it's on the spot, but like if, you know, reptile database is completely dependent on one person and something, it gets hit by a bus, what happens to that? But I would say on that end, you know, have the other end of the spectrum where Peter Oates is very active on INAT, you know, he'll chime in on these flags, we have this thing on my net where you can you can just like a Twitter, you can at mention someone. So I could type at Uts and you know what's what's going on here? And he'll chime right in on the flag and be like, oh, my bad. I'll you know, next update of reptile database, this will be taken care of. So it is, I think that's a tricky thing, is you know, there's this model of just having someone's just making the rules and they have enough, like Peter, and they have enough clout in the field that people just defer to them and doing this thankless task that everybody's grateful for. But there is a sense of this, if he gets hit by a bus, we're in trouble. And then there's a situation yeah. more like power is a bit more, I think, on the worm's end, where 
they're kind of an institution, but sometimes it's unclear who to talk to and the expectations about whether if you sort of talk to them, you're going to get any sort of, you know, uh, feedback or understanding or, or uh, you know, someone on the other end of the phone. Yeah, this is the emphasis is just shows how important people are, right? Like it's really yeah. people that do the work. At the end of the day, one individual has to, to do that hard work to, to encode it, to fix, to update, to, to make the decision to go um, here or there. So, um, yeah, there's no escaping that. We had a question about um, um, in the background about your API use. So when I see all the things that you're doing there, my mind is just going about, okay, how, how can I access these things? How can I access these deviations? But it was just a simple question. Um, if it, j just to share with, uh, in fact, our users who are getting more and more knowledgeable about the use of APIs, um, what can you do with your API? So the, the initial question was, can I use it to retrieve a link to a species page in INAT by giving you a taxonomic name, a scientific name? What, what kind of functionality can we, could we think about using and, and integrating into taxon pages, for example, since you uh, species file group? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I did not plan this. I would like to mix up with a different example, but like, for example, if, um, if I go to uh, uh, reptile database for this species, you know, they have this little like, can you help confirm these observations of Scalopris accidentalis on a naturalist? Oh, very cool. Using that API to pull up some, um, you know, some examples of these species. So yeah, I mean, the iNaturalist API is really robust in terms of, you know, being able to grab tax on things like this. Some of these more in the weeds things that we're talking about about taxon framework relationships and taxon changes and stuff aren't as developed in the api but like you know and we just we just ask that you use the api more for something like this where you want to do something dynamic um we have also the other thing that's helpful in inat is you go all the way to the bottom and it says uh developers documentation for developers mm -hmm. and you click there and this has all the information about the api but we also have um big uh exports so for example this is our whole taxonomy archive so if you're doing anything with that more just to sort of get access to all the data, please don't use the API for that. You know, we have usually archives available for that kind of stuff. The API is best when it's, you know, it's fine for experiments and stuff. But if you're trying to do something production, you know, it should be more like a user clicks on something that makes an API call versus like yeah, yeah. Every night we're going to use the API to get a whole mirror of the data and, and deploy it somewhere. Yeah, that's a great uh, important for our use of our API right now. We have had very little problems, but uh, it's, it's, it's a good lesson learned from everything you've experienced that that um, controlling so that fire hose, so to speak, can be a little bit tricky. Um, that led me to another question for you, but let's see. Um, where did that go? I, I had a, just a quick observation that I wanted to add while you find that, Matt. Um, to give a, an example to others, although we haven't incorporated it directly yet. There's certainly a researcher down under who studies the weevils in Timine, I think, and he uses INAT. He pings Maria Marta in the way you're suggesting for a given taxonomic group so that he can both help do identifications, but also that help discovery on his end for what might is being found all around the world. So he has set up a ping uh, to the API of INAT that pulls back and he we don't know exactly how he does that, but he certainly uses that data back inside his instance of tax on that. Yeah, it was one of the feature requests that came out of our workshops last year um, to be able to link um, the observation images in INAT to uh, observations in tax on works. And so uh, it, it, your API easily makes that possible. It's a matter of prioritizing and sort of virtualizing in the, in the past systems that we've worked on um, you know, you, you, you can store images on TaxonWorks, but we also, in previous versions, you would have virtual images that looked like your image was in TaxonWorks, but it was really on MorphBank or, or some other um, system. And that's essentially what we need to do for INAT uh, so that we could, it would look like for all intents and purposes, you're curating an image in TaxonWorks and you're linking that through a depiction relationship to your various different objects, but that image is persisted on, uh, on uh, INAT. Um, so we know we know that functionality, how to do that, and it's a matter of sort of prioritizing and doing that so that we can get that data out. And yeah, we know that the the API gives us what we need in that regard. Um, so I talk. I'm going to geek out for so on software for just a couple minutes, uh, Scott. 
and then we'll get back to maybe more of the biology. But um, I, I've always liked INAT because it's a Rails app. And um, for those of you who don't know, Rails is just sort of a application uh, framework that lets you code in Ruby and, and create some um, um, relatively simple conventional system to uh, build out a web application. And I'm sure it's evolved a lot from then. I'm sure you have a lot of JavaScript and stuff, but one of the things we have when we've made our code bases um, available in both cases is that you get a bunch of issues and you have a lot. I think I checked and it saw something like 500 issues. We can share the links in the chat. Uh, there was like 500 issues in, in INAT and then uh, there was like 700 issues in, in TaxonWorks and Nikki Nicholson earlier today uh, noted that, you know, how do you prioritize in all of this? You, you have an immense amount of suggestions for what should happen. Um, some of them are like probably, you know, you, you put out the critical fires. These are all, these could be really cool, well thought out ideas, but you, you've got limited resources. So maybe just saying a little bit about how you prioritize. Um, you, you're obviously operating on a far bigger scale than we are in TaxonWorks, um, but it's interesting to see parallels in, the, in this, you know, making these issues available um, and, and sort of working on them. So how, how do you prioritize? Well, I mean, we, uh, I, we are fortunate to have some open source to, uh, contributions from people, but um, I'm trying to find our web project. But, um, you know, yeah, no, for sure. We have a huge backlog and it's really hard. I mean, you know, in all these projects, you know, it's it's not like startups where you have, you know, to where the where the ambition matches the resources. You know, we've, we're total skeleton crew. And yeah, um, but uh, we do have a, a, a GitHub project where we sort of try to put some of these issues at the top. And then, you know, we try to instruct our, um, you know, just external collaborators who want to pick off some issues um, to pull from the top of that queue. And um, yeah, it, but it's it's hard. I mean, like you're saying that sometimes I feel like we do a better job of really small tasks than anything quite yeah. large. And mm -hmm. um, those are, I think, where we have more of a gap is like, okay, we could just do this super quick thing, but let's address this issue more holistically. Those can be hard. Yeah. And, you know, it's obviously tricky with the, I mean, in, in many ways, the taxonomy is kind of the, the beating heart of iNaturalist, but it's also easy to say this isn't really a priority. You know, our priority is keeping most of our users happy and, you know, it's kind of behind the scenes. I mean, I would love to get to a point where we could just rip it all out and like just sync up to something like taxon works or catalog of life but yeah. the the test there is what the community will 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 go with and i mean it's i yeah. think that's one thing my only kind of complaint with some of the sort of taxonomy fields is it doesn't have a user often really close to the development and the product and i think that's one thing that's fun working on a citizen science project like iNaturalist is you you definitely have a user uh -huh. some yeah. things might work in kind of like an academic sense or an ivory tower sense but like yeah it does not work with the community and um, yeah, I mean, I would love, to, yeah, anything we can do to kind of get the taxonomic community to, to kind of like hone in on some of these use cases. And sometimes I feel like there's, you know, it, it gets down this rabbit hole of like, oh, talking about, you know, yeah, exactly. architecture and stuff. It's like, it's not that hard. You know, I think we could just fill some of these gaps. You're even getting like genus level, you know, taxonomies for some of these bigger groups some clear protocols on like who's kind of updating them when they're updating, I think would make a huge difference. So we sort of need a clearinghouse, right? Like, so gaps is a, pro a popular topic amongst our group and really embracing them and like sort of celebrating them and instead of like complaining about them, can we, can we use gaps as a way to, to attract resources, maybe like grants? Um, could we use the gaps as, you know, in INAT and, and your needs as a way to say, like, look, we need this new fundamental infrastructure. We need to go and gut some systems and, and you know, maybe share a code base. Um, and it's because of these real these real needs, right? Like you, you can demonstrate um, many, many cases where you have gaps. This is a well-known thing. You you can demonstrate that you're doing public citizen scientist, science better than, you know, anybody. So to me, that's like, we need to be able to spin that around and send that at, at NSF and say, let's let's workshop this. Let's, let's, let's go hard on a couple of hackathons. Let's bring in a couple of experts. Let's gut it and let's let's put the brain. Let's you know, like software architect this for the long term. Um, it seems like an interesting challenge. I, it 
certainly resonates for me the way I'm always talking about uh, many people here in their own instances know what the gaps are, right? How do the rest of us see those gaps? The cool way in which you gave this example, Scott, that you know we're pulling from the API, uh, Peter is able to say, here's some that need help. So in his own realm, doing what he can to pull in other people to look at those gaps, how can we highlight those as a way to help from the public to the experts to help address what those gaps are? Um, I think it's a cool opportunity to invite more people to the party. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, we've had a couple of people talk about, um, you know, obviously it's on everybody's mind is, is AI and chat GPT and um, I know you've run some experiments on um, basically what you can do with your image corpus. And I, I've heard a couple of talks from you in the past, uh, um, or from, from mine out, I should say, um, where you sort of were talking to a more of a scientific audience and you were saying, here's what we can do and here's what we can't do. You know, like, here's the promise. And, and, and I know a lot of people will, and it's obviously very dependent on the group, be, be say, say nothing but glowing reviews about your ability to guide them towards the correct classification of an image. Um, so maybe you can say a little bit about where you're at. And again, it's a limited resource thing, but are, are you are you jumping on the AI bandwagon? Are you jumping on the chat GBT bandwagon? Is this gonna solve all your problems at INAT? <laughs> I feel like we kind of went through, I mean, it's kind of fun in a way to see literally every industry ranging from like lawyers to like, you know, architects yeah. like grappling with this. Cause we've been grappling with, I mean, iNatural started you know, as this crowdsourcing thing you know, it was always, I remember like Smithsonian's leaf snap was even before AI, but it was, a, you know, it was a machine way of kind of getting an idea. It was like sort of a John Henry thing. Like is it man versus machine, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I love then, this analogy. Yeah. And then what was interesting is when the whole deep learning revolution came out and it turns out that it's not about the algorithm. It's just about computing power and having really big data sets. And iNaturalist was really close to this biggest data set of labeled images in the world of living things that it was actually really easy for us to get really involved in the in the AP in, in the AI world. So we were the first people to release a you know a classic computer vision model that had more than than a couple thousand classes of species. And we're currently um actually now that I have it up, um the um uh we currently have eighty thousand species in our um in our model. So let me pull this up. Here it is. Um so for almost a year now, actually just a little over a year, we've been training one model a month. And you can see over time, the, the number of species goes up about a thousand to 2000 a month. And it's been kind of fun for the community to be able to see, you know, for example, what are the new amphibians in this model? So like, here's the um, 15 new species of amphibian that, you know, we released in, in that model. And it's even kind of fun. You can sort of see, I'm going to pull off captive. So get rid of the zoo animals, but you can kind of see where those occur and generally you know we're getting for things like amphibians you know we're still picking up a couple in the united states appalachia or maybe like the european alps but mostly you know where we're adding new species of amphibian it's in the tropics whereas Very we're cool. still getting a lot of new species of plants and insects in the model um from you know where we may, you know europe and in north america so that's been fun and just trying to keep our accuracy high we were we evaluate our accuracy about 87 percent for top one accuracy uh, for all taxa globally, you know, that's obviously differently if you look at just different places in the globe or different taxa. And, um, you know, and that's, we're trying to maintain that or improve that as we add these new 2000 species or 1000 species per month. So that's, that's working well. Um, but, you know, so we, we went through all that with this now, you know, now, you know, years ago, you know, Google Lens is able to do this stuff and all these other things. We haven't really gotten into the langu large language models, which I think is what you're talking about. Yeah, but yeah, that's the kind of thing everybody's grappling with. But for sure, I mean, I think it would be really neat to have the idea of these AIs not just telling you what something is, but actually telling you why it is. You know, and, and you mm. see the potential to do that with these large language models, like, oh, you know, this is Cacohortus albus, and it's because it's got white petals, and you know, th that's kind of neat and sort of an interactive AI. So that's something yeah. we're definitely interested in, but we haven't taken. I mean, we're we're maxed out just trying to keep this thing growing but then quickly on terms of like 
in terms of this idea of having this ability to make predictions about what something is for 80,000 tax to keep that growing, I think of the bottlenecks. So one is like, there's just certain places in the world where people haven't gone. And there's places where people have gone there, but they're not they're not looking at those taxa. Maybe they're they're bird watching and looking for salamanders, but they're ignoring plants or something. Then there's situations where um, we have observations of these things, but we don't have the identification expertise in the community. So they're just sitting at genus or family. I think that's huge. We needed to figure out a way to engage. And I know it's, again, overworked and underpaid, but engage some of this expertise in the taxonomic community to help get these ID'd. And then even then, sometimes it's, well, these can't be ID'd because you need photos of particular things. And I do think there's enough feedback in INAT that that word gets out of the community. They're like, hey, if you want to get an ID on this millipede, make sure you photograph its, you know, its butt. Like that, that does <laughs> yeah. work. But then there's also situations where you hit this taxonomic floor. I think of it as like significant figures or like maybe with a microscope when you hit the, yeah, yeah. You hit the wavelength of light and you just can't go any further. Exactly. Where, look, this isn't going to get ID because these are all either new species or they're just one species or 10. Someone needs to do work on this. And that's where I would love too to figure out that's the bottleneck. Like, can we focus resources there? Can we actually get yeah. a way of saying like, okay, then let's revise this group. And it, and it, sometimes it feels like there's just not that can do attitude. It's like, well, that's going to happen 20 years from now. There's a certain urgency about this work, you know, in terms of yeah. conservation, you know, we only have a decade or so to get our house in order. And like, you know, if there is a way, it always feels like it just ends there. Like, well, this is just, these are all indescribed and this is a big mess. And just some way that we could, focus kind of this energy on those gaps and fill them. I think that's a really neat point of synergy because you're here, we're hearing this from a group that is, you know, built this from the citizen scientists and you're, you're, you're highlighting an incredibly important need, right? And you've can, you can tell us which groups those are. You're not making this up. This is coming from the data of the observations that are there. And so can we, you know, again, write some flags some algorithm detection that says, okay, look, we've got this many observations. Um, we can go to GBF and find that there's specimens available for this. Let's do an emergency revision, right? And then we we can we put all the data into taxon works. We slurp it all up. Somebody grinds on it because we pay them, right? Because we went to NSF or we got a PhD or something, and and we we sort of fast track. Uh, we have, you know a startup for revisions, right? That that is glued together by um, some some really grounded uh, data. I think it'd be a cool idea. Um, yeah, again, thinking about it as an opportunity rather than like oh this person is old and when they need a new person involved and stuff um we got to kind of spin it and pitch it a little bit more uh you know aggressively maybe um yeah cool stuff uh i had another question that came up ah it, so you said the bottleneck about about getting those identifications so you have some data that you need bottlenecks on are do you have like processing bottlenecks like um like do you have more data than you can then process into your uh, models. Uh, basically, you're 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 waiting for compute time. Is that the general problem, or do you have more than enough commute, compute time to to calculate with? Uh, like in, in terms of is it data or compute that's bottlenecking you um, for advancing your vision model? Um, I mean, I, I would say both, but I mean, yeah. you know, in terms of the current framework, like we could do these monthly iterations. We try to do one experiment per month, you know, to try something to improve, you know, to see if, you know, if we did this change to the model, we can get a little bit more accuracy out of there. But also there's just constant changes we have to make to sort of keep that training time a month without, as the data sits growing by, you know, we're getting, you know, 5 million records a month now, you know, so you yeah. have to keep the ability to train that. And so that's making different choices about how to turn that data set into a training data set, which is maybe what you're, what you're alluding yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But basically when we train that model every, every month, we're, we're, we're dealing with the data we have. And so that's the both the taxonomy we have at the time, you know, and that's what's been really useful with this monthly iteration is like there's this taxonomic drift because every day the taxonomy is changing on INAT. And when we were releasing a model every year, it's referring to a taxonomy from a year ago. That was a big problem. So it's nice yeah. having that monthly iteration. It helps with the feedback. You know, people can say like the model's really sucking with this group. They're going to do a ton yeah. of work cleaning that group up. And then in a month, they can see that their efforts paid off. But pretty much every monthly model, you know, it's based on the data we have and like, it's, you know, like I was saying, sometimes it's just getting more obs in there, but a lot of it, I think is, I think a lot of it is identification. You know, we just, we just need the expertise to go in there. And I wish, sometimes I feel like there's sort of this a little bit, you know, like this vibe from the taxonomic community that like INAT is this thing for the public and the accuracy sucks. And like, that's why we, the professional community shouldn't use it. 
And it's like, the, <laughs> that's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, I, I wish the answer yeah. to that was like, we really get, need to get involved in this thing because public's yeah, involved. Yeah. I mean, we uh, can mark, help yeah. with this yeah. data quality thing, but I would love just creative. And, and I know, again, it's just underpaid and overworked. The last thing professional taxonomist wants to think they need to do is like yeah. a bunch of unpaid volunteer work. But I think, I think but it's like, a matter of, of seeing that gap as an opportunity and spinning it around, um, you know, as a, as a grant, grantable challenge, right. As a fundable challenge. Uh, there's a lot of cool things. It struck me that when you were talking about um, the chat GBT, I had this vision of, of using your image model to actually like draw some gigantic gigapixel of the tree of life, right? Like just throw all of his image, like since mid journey style, with the with the AI, like draw me the tree of life, and it goes to iNaturalist, and it draws animals all over. So I don't know if you can see in the background of my uh, of my screen here, but so you're just gonna, you know, it'd be this awesome. Then they can display it on the sphere, right, in Las Vegas as a as a as a big public outreach. The tree of life drawn in 18k megapixels, zooming in on branches. I don't know, it'd be cool stuff like that. Um, I want to make sure we're not missing questions from our audience and. Um, you know, I've been kind of geeking out on, on the technical side of things. Um, audience folks, are we, do you have questions for Scott and iNaturalist? And um, what's resonating with you in terms of like the kind of work and tools that you um, are using, kind of work that you're doing with uh, what you've heard here? Uh, we have Michelle. Go, Michelle. I just wanted to say how much I really appreciate iNaturalist. Um, as a collections manager, you know, I do, I work with collections, but I don't study any one specific thing. Um, but I love going out and taking pictures of things. And I love that there's a space where I can just upload a picture and it will help me identify it. And then I feel like I've contributed um, because I also don't really like collecting. I feel bad about killing everything. I'd rather take pictures of things. So I just want to say how much I really appreciate iNaturalist. Thank you. Maria Marta, go ahead. Okay. It is, I have already done the question related to the links. Uh, I am the, I manage the orthoptera species file database, and we have just had a workshop on that and taxon works. We have just migrated to taxon works and had a workshop uh, during the last uh, Congress that was last week, the International Congress of Orthopteries. And one of the things that they ask us is to add links to I need naturalists from our uh, taxon pages. So our community uh, contributes a lot with iNaturalist and they, they really uh, like it. And we think that, and I, I've seen that there have many experts who are creating the data. And uh, so for, for our community is great. So we'd be, Thanks to your uh, the 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 creation of the API, we'll be adding uh, links to the taxon pages of uh, Orthopter species file. So thank you, it was great. I think if you have super program and project, uh, we really like it and appreciate it a lot. And it's really be been really helpful for identifications of grasshoppers and crickets and cattails. So thank you, Scott. Thank you. That's fantastic. Scott, I want to chime in on that a little bit, just to point out that the project Taxon Pages is a separate entity. It's not Taxon Works. Um, and we're trying to make that agnostic. The idea is that panels inside a Taxon page answer a specific question. And um, I don't know, I know your programmers are slammed and stuff too, but we're really trying to look for the first couple of panels that would draw from other APIs. And I, uh, I not images as a optional panel in the configuration of your taxon page would be really compelling to a lot of uh, users of that software and we've tried to set it up so uh, jose is here and um, the lead, one of the lead developers there that we can add panels as modules right and then make this kind of modular system of a taxon page so um, just to put that on your community's radar that if they do that uh, there's a there's a great chance that that's going to get used in our in our taxon page framework in our in the projects that are using taxon works and also tax on pages. Uh, Donalo asks, uh, are there experiences of collections using iNaturalist to improve the identification of the taxa for which they don't have specialists? So 
I'm guessing but specifically maybe, natural history collections. I think so. I think that's yeah. Using collections to help improve identifications on a naturalist. So the other way around, using oh, like, way so around. if you have yeah. a collection yeah. and and it's yeah. got diverse specimens inside of it, um, yeah. do you know of stories where they've taken advantage of the determinations in INAT to improve the annotations on those specimens in their collection? Well, I would. I mean, I don't know if this is the right, but we we hear a lot. You know, like someone saw something on a naturalist, like wow, there's this you know, report of this species from this area. And then that's prompted the field activities and the collections that's needed to publish an important discovery, whether that's a new species or, uh, you know, an important range of extension or a revision. So for sure, I feel like there's a neat feedback there, wow. you know, um, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure more in terms of, I, I noticed a paper just this month, there's a new phytologist, I think, did a did a, an issue that had two papers that mentioned and one of them was this idea of like a, a you know, a, a, this sort of photogrammic technique that people could use, essentially just putting a background beneath their photographs in INAT that would help orient ah. things like mm -hmm. especially leaves and things so that they could be used mm -hmm. more in the sort of collection context. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's great. I mean, again, just like taxon works, I think the lesson here is just to keep things as open as possible because to let people be creative and mash things up and try things you know that's been key and taxon works you guys are doing a fantastic job with that too and so i think it's also cool there's some good philosophical links between inat and taxon works yeah um in my experience dello and i'll whack my brain to think of who but the answer is yes i do know i've visited collections where they are actively using what's been identified and a picture of it on inat to either improve or inform the determinations they have that might need to be looked at again, for example, for the specimens they hold. And if I can think of who that is, I'll let you know. <laughs> and Peter's been waiting now. Um, yeah, hi. <clears throat> hi, hi everybody, and Scott. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of INAT, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, and I think actually to what you just said, I think it's extremely important that we have live pictures in addition to all the pictures from museum specimens because you have the colors and all that stuff and the environment and the habitat. So one, one question I get quite frequently is, what do you do about all the misidentifications you have? And that's related to some of the identifications we just talked about, because in some groups, you know, there are, there are a, a large number of misidentified pictures. Is there any particular you know thing you you're planning or currently doing to address this problem? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, so one of the things I think is interesting is that most a lot of those misidentifications are coming from the AI, you know, and we envision the AI as sort of a way of, you know, helping kind of reduce the burden of of um, identification load. I think it's certainly doing that, but it's also coming a lot. Uh, you know, it's creating a lot of people who are clicking on these weird answers. Um, one of the things we just released is this geo model thing, which I think is really interesting, which is, um, it was in our blog here, but remember when we, when a naturalist is offering suggestions, it's not just, it's not just based on what it looks like. It's based on what it looks like and what's likely to be nearby. And we have so essentially two deep learning models. Now this the computer vision model and this to, to help with that. I, I going into this product project, I was like, this is going to help with all those IDs. And then I'm realizing that a lot of those people, like we've always, we've always, the, the AI, in our naturals, the AI is never choosing. It's presenting suggestions to the user and the user is picking one of those. And it's amazing to me when we're doing this study on this, how most of these bad ideas that are coming from the AI are people choosing things quite low on the list. So clearly that's an, a UI problem for us. Like we shouldn't be suggesting these things or we should have some sort of alert that's like, are you sure? Because that's really unusual. But that was interesting to me. And I think that's mostly because people are looking at the representative taxon photo. Maybe they have a particular, their photo is a particular angle or life stage or something. And then they're picking the one that kind of looks like that. But, you know, I, I think that that's one thing we really can do is get rid of. So I, I'm just, who knows what this will look like, but like, let's just pick a, a common species here, like plateau fence lizard. And, you know, actually this one's pretty good, but, it, you know, you can, just by picking commonly observed species here, you can see, let me pick one at the very top here. Like this will probably be, well, let's do, I don't know, maybe ring tail snake. Um, you know, you get every day, a, this is pretty good too. 
um, a sprinkling of observations around the world. And that's because, and I think that can be really frustrating for the identifiers is they're like, man, just every day you were getting, you know, a bunch of these observations that are just from around the world that are just clearly wrong. Why is that happening? And that's on us. And we're definitely trying to figure out ways to reduce that. And I think the big discovery for us is that's not the AI making bad predictions as much as it is people selecting wow. bad things, which is interesting, but um, for sure, I think there's a lot we can do to improve the AI. The other thing we, you know, we talked a lot over the years about this idea, you know, iNaturals, everybody gets the same vote. So it's this very egalitarian um, uh, thing, you know, introducing more reputation type systems or ways of actually measuring skill, pushing IDs based on the skill of the user. We can't estimate that stuff, but we haven't really had the resources to kind of swap out that whole system. I don't know if that answers any of your question. Yeah, so I've, I've one sentence to add. So one of the things we do at a reptile database is that we are now systematically collecting all the descriptions of species. So if, if somebody takes a picture, in theory, they could go to the reptile database and look up the diagnosis to see which characters actually are used for identifying something. I'm not sure how many people do that, probably not many, but um, maybe that's something that other databases could do as well. And I know that not many taxonomic databases have detailed text descriptions, but that's certainly one thing to do for other people in the future for like the whole audience here. Sorry, you're saying use the use the actually characters for identification from yeah, yeah, yeah. not 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 uh, the normal user, but uh, like if people are interested, you know, they in theory could now find a description online of a species to confirm it, like uh, not just based on the picture, but also on real little nitty gritty details, you know, which may be critical. I mean, I don't know how this is in other groups, but in reptiles, there's so much splitting going on that a lot of species are so similar that are almost impossible to um, identify. Uh huh. Um, So, so in that case, you're, I mean, that's a slightly different problem, right? This is a very important, but a different problem when like, when is it just, we, you really, we really shouldn't be IDing down to species. We should be leaving these things at, at, at genus. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. And that's a tricky other problem. What I'm trying to do here is find some examples of everything I've been looking at. That's another thing I would love to be more, I would love to have better I mean, I, I feel like I still have a pretty good handle on INAT, even though it's gotten bigger. To, it's hard to keep tabs on it. I, I still, my gut is like the data is pretty pretty high. And I would love to have better statistics about what it is. Because then we could say like, okay, what are we talking about? Are we trying to you know talk about keep this above 80% yeah. and we're at 82? We don't know that. But I, I would be interested to see, have better metrics about that. My sense is still it's pretty high, but we need to be more quantitative about what we're talking about. And then it's like you're saying, it's still, it doesn't matter if there's this perceived um, sense that it's low, or if like you're saying, it's only high because the community is is just bailing buckets and they're getting turned off and they're about to quit because we're not solving a problem they have. That That's very concerning to me. Is there any indication that that's the case, Scott? Because I mean, like, Bailing buckets is still, you know, if, if it's going to destroy your community, that's bad. Yeah. But if it keeps everything in check, and like you said, and that keeping in check is only two, three, four percent, then that's actually extremely good, right? Like that's that's an amazing work and kudos to the community. So we've, yeah. we've definitely, we haven't had, um, the, the statistic we used to always track is the number of IDs people make for other people. And that statistic has actually gone up um, because and I, but I think it's because um, it's so much easier to make an ID with a computer vision, and then you might actually not be adding any expertise. You're just, you know, mm -hmm. following the suggestion. So maybe that statistics becoming useless. So again, I would love to have the sort of sense of skill or expertise or data quality as the metric, but we're really not measuring that. And then the, another metric that is a little bit worrisome that's going down is the number of ideas relative to observers is going down. You know, and that mm. want to keep that. And you could argue that, that, well, that's just because we're getting more and more young mm -hmm. people and diverse audiences involved in observing, and it's a more finite group of identifiers, but it could also be that like, we're just 
not able to keep that pace. We generally have this order of magnitude difference. So we've had about 3 million people post observations and about 300,000 people post identification. So it's always been about an order of magnitude difference and mm -hmm. about a 10 times productivity difference. So even mm -hmm. though, mm -hmm. you know, even though there's an order of magnitude, less identifiers and observers, they're producing 10 IDs for every one mm -hmm. observation someone's producing. Cause you can just go ID, 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 yeah. ID. Yeah. But we have to get the incentives right. To, and I, I, I talk to, I hear a lot of people from the, taxonomic community who are either just like think the INAC data quality is really bad and therefore should not be something they're involved in or this idea that they're just they're just too this is too much work and it's the incentives aren't right and I I, I love to think of those both as solvable problems you know but ideas mm -hmm. for how to get the professional community more engaged I know I know when I took you know I did a couple of weekends where I just blitzed on INAT and you know I was in a, I'm a I worked on a relatively rare group of wasps, very small, and a diapriate. And um, there was a couple of UI things. I was like, just why can't why, why can't I just make all of these decisions much quicker? Like, like I can say something that's not, and I I could classify things into superfamily that were not diapriate. And there's a couple of things I was like, man, if I was a taxonomist, I would just want this, right? And I'm sure you've heard a billion suggestions for that kind of thing. Um, so. It's interesting to feel like I, I'm guessing that it's one of those things where you're just trying to balance it and like how much maybe the question is how much do you workshop like new ways to to add IDs to observations? Do you think about that from a UI UX perspective at all? Or is that sort of a done fixed like if we did something different, it's just going to piss off the community kind of thing. Familiarity rules sort of. Yeah, I, definitely. And I think I mean, there's some some of what you're talking about is philosophical, you know, like we definitely yeah, yeah. have a philosophy of like you know, there's the p ideas are made by people. So there is some intention, you know, we've had some people being like, I want to sort of select all of these and do that. Yeah. And that is a little tricky. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I, this is me, I'm the 234th idea. I've added about a hundred thousand IDs. And so I feel like I, I'm good, but then I'm good on that sort of scale, but it is amazing to think about, like you're saying, like his guy, like John Asher is added. Uh, 10 times more than that. And like, it's interesting to think about this level of sort of ID craziness. And like, so I've had a couple conversations with him and some of these other big identifiers, you know, trying to understand that use case, because I know it's fundamentally different. I mean, I'm one of the top identifiers of, of decapods. So if you just go down here, I'm, I'm number three. I was just like, my, my workflow here is what I do pretty much every day, like to kind of relax, you know, I, I click, I click, I choose decapods and I click on here and I go to this identify tool. And I just kind of go through these and like, so that's wrong. That's a, um, you know, blue laying crab. And then I just kind of go like this and it, I find it very relaxing. Like it's not, yeah, yeah. I it's not work. Thing. I don't know that. Yeah. Oh, I do agree with that. And just kind of thumb through these and it's, but you know, it's, it is interesting to think about the incentives, right. And if there are tools that we can make this process better, you know? Yeah. I, I remember, I remember after I did like, just blitzed for a day or two i got this massive list of notifications that everybody was agreeing with me and like in in diapriate taxonomy there's maybe 10 people who in the world that i knew of who could identify these things to genus right like it's about as good as we can do because they're so small and i'm like how why are they agreeing with me this is this really threw me that they're agreeing with me like you're adding like you're, it was this mis misunderstanding on my part that they're not they're, they're more like accepting it, right? It's not like they're they're also saying that this is that genus. I knew that they they there couldn't be that many people who knew how to identify diapreids the genus, right? For example, so there was some some lingo there that uh, yeah and that, that's that threw the, me at first, but I got it. You know, I understood what was going on. We try to be clear that like you should not add an ID. An ID should not be a, like a thumbs up or a thank you. you that's know, what it was. It was very clear instantly that of the maybe you know thousand things I did that 90% of them had to be thumbs up. They had to be. There just, there's no other way. I was not that out of touch <laughs> with the community, even though I've been gone from it for a while. Scott, we're, we're winding up. I, I, want, I had some other questions. I, I, I wanted to just echo that I love this idea about everybody getting the same vote. Um, in Taxon Works, we're specifically not added different role levels to, to various chagrin of, of some users. So if you're a project member, you get to do what everybody other project member does. And we have a philosophy that says, well, that encourages um, training and, and you know, like that, that you don't have this checking from everything and, and that really we should be building tools that help us 
catch when we make bad decisions rather than saying you can or can't do this. So I love this, everybody at the same boat, even though it makes developing apps really tricky. And, and it's a non-starter for some groups who want to use TaxonWorks. They need to have admin rights and say, you can't do this or that. Um, but it's interesting to hear you say that. Second, I also want to say that um, we were, it was really, it's been really interesting to hear you talk about latency, right? Like that you want to get data at the monthly basis because you're operating on, you know, improving at the monthly basis. And that's why COL didn't work for you. Like for us, it's like, why can't COL work? We have really close ties for them. But to hear that you have operations that will change significantly if you wait for those nine months and you want that data, you know, as soon as you can is, is really important to hear. So that whole idea of latency in the whole biodiversity informatics world, like how much time should we expect it to, for, you know, systems to change, for species concepts to change, for things to get integrated, for things to filter down the chain is, I think, a really interesting uh, uh, topic and, and maybe one to chew on later and, and to sort of educate people on just how much time it takes to do stuff, right, at different levels. So just to clarify, I mean, I was, I was talking there more for like getting the, the models out, but I mean, I would say our, our biggest issues with like Catalog of Life is more just the, the, we call the pitchforks from the community. I mean, you know, like the community just at a certain point, our naturals only works because we're getting engagement from this group and they're like i'm not going to do this because their taxonomy is all wrong uh -huh, and uh -huh. you know it's there's it's, sometimes it's that's just i mean i i was calling you out so much peter <laughs> thanks for <laughs> but you know like it, it is like this work to kind of bring the community along and you know it's yeah. we really struggled with that with powwow because i think that's a good example where there was a you know really strong culture of regional floras and people are just like no way man we use the european flora here no way we're using this power thing and and you can break the thing if you move it too far but like it's about trying to get these two sides and listening to them and bring them together and that's what i yeah i mean I, and i'm kind of out of the loop with the catalog of life and i think the stuff that's happening there is really exciting and, and promising but you know back circa 2008 you know it was more this kind of top-down academic project that was big gap between that and anybody who was actually trying to use it and it's I think really interesting to hear and i, I think yeah, I think we have closer connections. I think there's stuff that's evolved and it's it, it's really important to keep that conversation going back and forth to see if we can improve all around. Well, Scott, I want to thank you uh, very much for joining us for this hour and this conversation. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you in the last couple of weeks and to have you here at Taxonomers Together. Um, I'm sure we'll be in contact in the future and you're welcome to hang out as we jump into unconference style, but um, we, we know that you're busier than beyond belief. I can't even fathom it so thank you scott from everyone um thanks so much guys it was great to great to chat and really appreciate everything you guys are doing cool thanks very much looking forward to more conversations scott about how we can align 